again, uh, yesterday we have seen uh, the various videos uh, uh, showing uh, the intracapsular cataract extraction, extracapsular cataract extraction, and also uh, small intestine cataract surgery, PACO emancipation in animation, and PACO emancipation live, all these things. And there is another manual, small intestine cataract surgery, uh, which we have here and which you are going to see now. And later on, we'll uh, talk about actually the post-operative uh, uh, complications and prior to that actually, uh, the various, uh, uh, the management in the immediate post-operative period, what drugs actually we give to the patient, that also we are going to see. And finally, uh, in the end of the class, I think I'll show you a small video about uh, the femtosecond assisted laser. Femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. Okay. And so uh, we start the video. This is a man. One technique for performing small manual small incision cataract surgery. This case was done while on a mission trip in southern Africa. After retrobulbar anesthesia is achieved, the first step is to perform so, a peritomy for about three to four clock hours superior. Phonics based conjunctive. Next, uh, electrocautery is used to obtain hemostasis. This is very that important so that you have a good view while making your scleral point. incision. Rather than using calipers, I use the edge of the crescent plate to measure back from the limbus and then begin my frown shaped scleral incision. This is generally about 40 to 50 percent depth of the sclera. The crescent blade is then used to tunnel towards the clear cornea, keeping in that same plane. It's very important not to become too superficial or too deep as this would result in premature entry into the anterior chamber and potentially iris prolapse during the case. To ensure that this incision closes without sutures, it's important to make sure that it is wider internally than externally. Next, a paracentesis port is created, which is large enough to accommodate the Simcoe cannula. Vision blue is injected into the anterior chamber to stay in the lens capsule, and then is rinsed with balanced salt solution. The anterior chamber is then filled with viscoelastic. The keratone blade is then used to enter the scleral tunnel that was formed previously and aim downward, similar to how you would make a triplanar incision in clear corneal cataract surgery. A cystotome is then used to begin the capsular rexus. This can be done either as a continuous curvilinear rexus, as is shown here, or as a can opener technique. It's important to ensure that this capsular rexus is relatively large compared to those that we use for fake emulsification. And then the incision is enlarged again with the keratone blade. You can see how pronounced that internal opening is relative to the external. The Chan cannula is used to perform some hydrodissection, and you can see that this lens nucleus very easily rotates up and out of the capsular bag. In this step, it's important to make sure that the lens nucleus is in the anterior chamber and is not in the bag anymore. Next, viscoelastic is used to inject underneath the lens and help the lens come into that incision we've created. Here you can see that the lens already essentially exits the eye. The lens loop is used to remove the lens from the eye. And then the Simcoe cannula is used to remove the remaining cortical material. Some of these cases can be very quick and easy when there is not much cortex left. This elastic is used to fill the capsular bag. And then a one piece PMMA lens is placed into the eye using forceps. And then using a Sinsky hook, it is grasped by this eyelet and then rotated into the capsular bag. Once the lens is in the eye, the Simcoe cannula is again used to remove the viscoelastic via the main incision. The incisions are then hydrated with a BSS cannula, and the eye is checked to ensure that it is watertight. In this instance, I'm giving an intravitreal injection of triamcinolone and moxifloxacin mixture. The conjunctival peritomy is then closed with cautery, and the case is terminated.
Well, uh, we have seen different types of actually the cataract surgeries. So starting from intra couching and intracapsular cataract extraction, conventional extracapsular cataract extraction, and small incision cataract surgery, manual small incision cataract surgery, and also FACO emulsification in animation and also uh, live FACO emulsification surgery. So I'll show you in the end actually the femtosecond assisted cataract surgery. So after doing all these surgeries, whatever be the type of surgery we do, uh, we, we uh, after finally after completion, we inject actually decadron along with gentamicin and emtacin subconjunctively, and uh, instill one or two drops of ipes and pyridine, and uh, then we close the uh, lid and put a patch. And we see the patients again after 24 hours. The next morning, we open the patch. So when we open the patch, actually, we see whether uh, there is any discharge or whether there is any lid swelling, all these things, which indicates that there could have been actually some infection. Okay. So uh, during the immediate post-operative period, the management would be we instill antibiotic drops, moxifloxin, 0.03% percent uh, one drop four times per day for nearly about 10 to 15 days. And uh, we also inject, we also uh, instill uh, steroid drops, prednisolone state. Uh, we instill one drop six times per day. So this will continue for a longer period, say, say for about six, four to six weeks. And uh, the uh, we also instill uh, diclofenac sodium or ibuprofen, any, any NSAIDs, one drop thrice daily for about uh, say four to uh, four, five to seven days. And uh, we can as well give an oral antibiotic and also oral anti-inflammatory agents such as diclofenac sodium uh, thrice daily or acetylfenac with paracetamol thrice daily for about three to five days to reduce the inflammation and also the pain if at all the patient has. And uh, we instill cyclopentylate or trivotropicamide one drop twice daily for about, uh, say, five to uh, seven days. And uh, so this is actually the immediate uh, starting of the treatment in the post immediate post-operative period of any cataract surgery. Or by whatever means we do, actually. This is the way, actually, we uh, prescribe the drugs in the immediate post-operative period. So uh, the steroids will have to be continued for not less than about four to six weeks, as I had told you. And uh, we refract the patients depending upon the type of surgery. Suppose if it is an ICC along with our ECC conventional one, uh, we refract the patients around, uh, say, 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 after six weeks, and then we prescribe the glasses. In case of small instant cataract surgery and also pack emulsification, uh, we refract the patients uh, at, after four weeks and we prescribe them the glasses. So depending upon actually the type of eye oil we put in, suppose if it is a unifocal eye oil, we give uh, the correction for the distance and also correction for the near. Okay. So this is how we do these surgeries. And now we go on to the post-operative complications of cataract surgery. Uh, so the first and foremost is the complications of the cataract surgery can be divided as pre-operative complications, perioperative complications, immediate post-operative complications, and late post-operative complications, complications associated with the, the IOL. So these are the various things actually we can have actually on the in cataract surgery. So pre-operative complications are first anxiety. So any surgery, whoever undergoes any surgery, there will definitely be some sort of anxiety. So to allay anxiety and apprehension of the individual, normally we give them the day before the surgery, either alpazolam 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams or valium say, or diazepam tablets, five milligrams. We give it in the night, we give it at the night time, the day before the surgery, okay? And second complication is an nausea and gastritis. So these people, uh, as I told you, to reduce the intraocular pressure, we give them estizolamide or estizolamide 250 milligrams to 500 milligrams the day before the surgery, also on the day of the surgery. So because of this, actually the patients, they may develop actually this little uh, gastritis and nausea. We postpone the case for about a day or two and give them actually uh, 
Dizine or Pantop, Pantoprazole, uh, Rabiprazole, all these things. And when once actually the gastritis actually comes down, we try to avoid activation of amide unless otherwise it is really indicated. And then we proceed for this surgery. So third one is an allergic conjunctivitis. Allergic conjunctivitis occurs because of actually whenever we instill the drugs, the base of the drug actually, that causes actually the allergic reaction in the particular uh, eye. Suppose if the patient is sensitive to the particular this thing. So the allergic conjunctivitis, it appears as redness and also uh, watering, photophobia and all these things. So at the moment actually you diagnose actual allergic conjunctivitis, we postpone the case again for about five days. We stop the particular uh, antibiotic drops. We try to instill the antibiotic drops without any basic at all if it is possible. And uh, after the allergic conjunctivitis actually it comes down and the eye is clear and quiet and then we start the, we do the surgery again. And corneal abrasions are in the complications which can occur preoperatively. So these corneal abrasions, they occur whenever you whenever you're taking actually intraocular pressure uh, preoperatively with your shards in dentition tonometer, the foot plate actually is put on the cornea after uh, uh, instilling uh, anesthetic drops, local anesthetic drops, paracaine or xylocaine, popes and drops. So, so this. Uh, inadvertently, sometimes actually may cause an, an, an injury to the corneal surface and a corneal abrasion can occur. Suppose if there is a corneal abrasion, we try to uh, postpone the case, treat the corneal abrasion with an antibiotic and uh, uh, corneal abrasion with an antibiotic. Antibiotic and cyc cycloplasic, okay, cyclopetalate or homotropine or whatever it is we try to uh, one minute. Sorry, I think uh, there was a uh, some defect. I think it's caused by me only. Uh, well, uh, we restarted. You have seen actually the uh, micro incisional cataract surgery, and we have seen different types of videos of different types of surgeries. Uh, a small, a small incision cataract, uh, no, intracapsular cataract extraction, extracapsular cataract extraction, small incision cataract surgery, phaco surgery in animation, and phaco surgery in uh, this thing, okay, uh, in light. And femtosecond assisted cataract surgery, I'll show you at the end of the uh, class. Uh, as, as I told you, whatever be the surgery, we finally we inject the jetamycin along with the decadron and uh, we pass the eye and we see the case actually after 24 hours. So uh, the moment actually you open the pass, you'll have to see whether there is any discharge, whether there is any uh, uh, lid swelling or, or sticking of the eyelids. So all these things we'll have to see, which indicates that there could have been actually an infection, okay? Uh, so after that, actually, we, uh, after opening the patch, we examine the patient completely, uh, the eye completely. And in the post-operative period, we give certain medications as a management, such as an antibiotic, an anti-inflammatory, uh, diclofenac or isoclopin with paracetamol, uh, ibuprofen, all these things can be given to alleviate pain, uh, in the particular individual, but that we give it for about five days. And uh, next, we instill local antibiotic drugs, moxifloxin or gatifloxin, 
So one drop around four times per day for nearly about uh, uh, 10 days to uh, 15 days. And next, we also in, instill a tropic mind or cycloplasic, cyclopentylate, one drop twice daily for about a week or 10 days. And uh, anti uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory agents such as ketorolac or uh, diclofenac sodium uh, or uh, these drugs, and uh, nepifenac, all these things we instill for about uh, uh, 10 to 15 days. And so this is actually routine management we do in case of actually cataract surgery. So the, after that, now we go on to actually preoperative com complications after, uh, after cataract surgery. So the complications of cataract surgery can be divided into a preoperative complications, perioperative complications, immediate postoperative complications, and late postoperative complications, complications associated with your IOL. Okay, so the first and foremost preoperative complication is an anxiety. So in this surgery, there will be some sort of anxiety and apprehension on the part of the individual who is going to be operated. So, so to allay apprehension in the particular individual, we try to give alprazolam 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams or diazepam 0.5 milligrams the night before the surgery. So the second complication is nausea and gastritis which can occur in the particular individual because of the histidolamide we give uh, prior to the surgery to reduce the intraocular pressure. So histidolamide normally it is given 250 milligrams to 500 milligrams the night before and also on the day of the surgery. So this is known to cause actually the gastritis and along with the gastritis there will be nausea and vomiting. Suppose if the patient has developed gastritis because of the histidolamide, we will have to stop histidolamide and give the patient a pantoprazole or rabiprazole or whatever it is and uh, we postpone the case for a day or two because uh, the retching and the vomitings and all these things uh, during the surgery uh, it gives a lot of problems for us to do the surgery okay and the third one is actually allergic conjunctivitis allergic conjunctivitis it uh, occurs because of the antibiotic drops we instill prior to the surgery mostly because of the base of the antibiotic, antibiotic drops so uh, we stop the particular antibiotic drop and uh, we wait for about three to four days till actually the conjunctival condition, uh, 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 photophobia, lacrimation, all these things, they come down and uh, the eye becomes white and quiet. And then we start the surgery again. And the fourth complication is actually the corneal abrasion. So this corneal abrasion can occur when you are taking intraocular pressure of the patient preoperatively with a Chiard's indentation tonometer. In this, while taking the intraocular pressure with Chiard's indentation tonometer, you keep the foot plate of the uh, tonometer over the cornea of the uh, individual after anesthetizing the cornea with porpoise and or paracaine. Okay. So, uh, inadvertently, there can be some injury and some corneal abrasion. In such cases, actually, what we do is uh, we postpone the uh, surgery and uh, we try to give actually uh, antibiotic drops and also cycloplasics for nearly about uh, uh, five to seven days. And after the epithelial abrasion heals and the cornea is white and white, in such cases, we start the restart the surgery again. So complications due to local anesthesia. So these are actually preoperative complications which can occur the day before when we are actually evaluating the patient and also when we are doing certain drugs as a preoperative medication to the individuals. Okay. So the complications on the day of the surgery, when we give actual local anesthesia, especially in retrobulbar anesthesia, there can be actually retrobulbar memories. So so these, you know, the retrobulbar uh, block is a blank technique. We feel actually the inferior orbital margin at the junction of the outer one third to the medial two thirds. We push in the needle. Retrobal bar needle is a very long one. And we go into the space, actual retrobal bar space, and we try to inject actually the drug into the behind the globe, retro, in the retrobal bar space. Okay. So because it is an in, it's a blank technique, and when you may hit some vessel, and uh, that may give rise to actually retrobal bar hemorrhage. So the moment actually retrobulbar hemorrhages, hemorrhage occurs, 
the patient will have, a, a, the, you see, the proptosing of the eye and the subconjunctal hemorrhages and eye becomes very hard and tense. In such cases, actually, you stop the drug, you stop the surgery and close the eyelid and postpone the case for about a week or so when retroval hemorrhage actually comes down and then we do the surgery. Okay. And second one is an oculocardiac reflex, which can occur in these individuals. So what happens is after you give the block, the patient develops bradycardia. So uh, we try to treat it with the atropine. Okay. And the third complication which can occur during the surgery because of the anesthesia is a perforation of the globe. So the perforation of the globe, and it, you know, as I told you, actually, uh, it's a blind procedure and we pierce all the layers. Uh, from anterior to the posterior, and that gives rise to perforation of the globe, and the globe becomes very, very soft. And so naturally, it becomes very difficult for us actually to do the surgery. So in such cases, what we do is we try to uh, postpone, the, we postpone the surgery, and you put a, an antibiotic drop and uh, pass the eye. So this it is a micro perforation, so it is going to get healed on its own. And the next morning, the uh, globe actually regains its uh, normal tonality and the tension will be normal and you will be able to do surgery in a day or two. And subconjunctal hemorrhages, these are other things which can occur during the uh, giving the block. And uh, so nothing to be done with that. Even if there is subconjunctal hemorrhage, it doesn't matter unless there is a a retroval bar hemorrhage associated with this also. Retroval bar hemorrhage, if it is there, actually we don't operate. If it is simply subconjunctal hemorrhage, we can uh, proceed with the surgery. Okay, And spontaneous dislocation of the lens. This also can occur in case if the jonules are very weak and hypermature cataract. In such conditions, actually, when you are uh, doing a lot of masses to reduce the intraorbital volume of the drug and also to reduce the intraocular pressure after giving the block, this can give rise to a dislocation of the lens into the posterior chamber and uh, posterior segment. And we need not really do, uh, we know we do, we're not supposed to do anything there. They better send the case to a vitreo retinal surgeon who will deal with it through pars plan. Okay. And operative complications during this surgery, what we'll have is, uh, in the, as I told you, we put the speculum to separate to separate actually the lips, universal eye speculum. And then we put in uh, a superior rectus bridal suture. So while putting the superior rectus bridal suture, there can be a superior rectus laceration and a hematoma. Okay, these are the these are first and foremost complication in case of uh, in, in perioperative complications. Okay, when you are cutting the conjunctiva, there can be excessive bleeding. So this can be cauterized. And when you are giving the incision, a gutter or groove in case of small intracapsular cataract extraction and extracapsular cataract extraction, uh, the incision can go, uh, the groove can go irregular incision. And this irregular incision gives rise to a defective coaptation of the wound and uh, an, a, an irregular astigmatism in the post-operative period. Injury to the cornea, can also occur this uh, while well, you are entering actually the anterior chamber. So inadvertently, you may uh, hit the cornea and that can give rise to a dismissed strip or you may uh, dismissed membrane stripping can occur. This is injury to the cornea which occurs, okay. Inadvertent, uh, third, fifthly, an inadvertent injury can also occur to the iris giving rise to an iridodialysis. The iris may be torn from its root, okay? And uh, an accidental rupture of capsule of the anterior chamber can also occur. Sorry, anti accidental rupture of lens capsule can also occur in the anterior chamber. So, uh, it requires uh, no special treatment. So there can be a vitreous loss. So vitreous loss actually, uh, it occurs Whenever uh, we are doing actually a capsulotomy, if the capsulotomy goes onto the posterior capsule and there is a posterior capsular rent, there can be actually a, a vitreous loss. 
and whenever you are removing the nucleus with the pressure and counter pressure are trying to aspirate the cortical matter with the uh, uh, an irrigation and aspiration cannula so inadvertently you may punch you may cause uh, damage to the posterior capsule and that can give rise to a posterior capsule or rent and the posterior capsule or uh, rent and vitreous collapse can occur vitreous disturbance can occur uh, what we do actually in case of vitreous loss is prior to the surgery itself suppose whenever you act, expect uh, this sort of things so uh, we give uh, the mannitol uh, 20 percent solution prior to the surgery or glycerol uh, orally or estazolamide 250 to 500 milligrams to reduce the aqueous volume all these things we do but to decrease the aqueous volume we give actually this thing and uh, better ocular echinacea and anesthesia is important the anesthetic drug actually the way procedure and everything is uh, very very important uh, you must minimize actually external pressure on the table on the on the eyeball okay so uh, whenever there is a vitreous loss which we try to remove uh, the speculum and uh, we try to remove actually the uh, artery forces we put for uh, superior rectus suture and in case of actually high myopes where, where actually there can be a possibility of a scleral collapse so we use actually a flaring glass ring to reduce actually vitreous loss so the consequences of vitreous loss are uh, it can uh, directly uh, come in contact with the uh, uh, cornea so vitreous touch syndrome and uh, it can actually go into the uh, suture line giving rise to defective uh, wound healing and incarceration of the wound into the post operative operative wound gives rise to defective wound healing and fibroplasia the residual vitreous surface and uh, it can uh, the recurrent inflammation of this and also can give can occur so uh, whenever there is a vitreous loss there will be an excessive degree of astigmatism because of the defective operation of the vitreous is left behind actually in uh, the section and uh, it can cause because of the vitreous touch of the cornea there can be actually a bullous keratopathy can occur and uh, the epithelial conjunctival epithelium it goes inside into the on the back side of the cornea and also over the uh, iris giving rise to epithelial invasion of the anterior chamber and the fibrous in growth wherever there is actual defective cooperation the co cooperation of the wound there can be actually fibrous in growth and uh, sometimes uh, a wound infection with uh, the resulting uh, catastrophic complications known as endophthalmitis can occur so whenever there is actually a tube vitreous loss or vitreous disturbance there will be an updrawn and misshapen blue pupil and fibroplastic traction bands can also be uh, seen in case of vitreous loss and uh, use it my finally end on end on to a secondary glaucoma which is really intractable and uh, in vitreous loss is uh, mostly associated with a cystoid macular edema and a papal edema okay and the vitreous opacities and vitreous hemorrhages can occur and uh, during the cataract surgery there can be actually expulsive ciliocoroidal hemorrhages okay so expulsive ciliocoroidal hemorrhages whenever it occurs usually it occurs in the elderly individuals with atherosclerosis and hypertension so this is most commonly seen in case of intracapsular cataract extraction and extracapsular cataract extraction and it is very very rare like in small incision cataract surgery or pacom incision or micro incision cataract surgery uh, and then probably not seen at all and uh, so how it happens is uh, the when we are doing the surgery the inadvertently when we are doing the surgery we see actually the section getting opened up and slowly the intraocular contents they make an exit out of the incision and finally a gush of blood actually it comes out so whenever we see the first sign of a, a, an expulsive ciliocoroidal hemorrhage we try to uh, remove all the uh, speculum superior rectus and everything close the lid and try to put pressure over it so uh, we try to evaluate the case usually the next day but in most of the cases of uh, expulsive ciliocoroidal hemorrhage 
the prognosis is very very poor and uh, the patients usually they do lose, do lose the eye and fibroblastic condensation of the residual vitreous also occurs and very rarely retinal detachment and chronic ocular irritability is also seen so management of the vitreous loss recognition of uh, dangerous eye before surgery uh, in the sense uh, as, as so you will have to uh, in my ops actually there can be lack of sclera rigidity so in such cases actually you will have to be very careful suppose if we think actually there can be extra vitreous loss and all these things uh, we try we take special precautions prior to the surgery and during the surgery also such as uh, reducing the vitreous volume or condensing the vitreous volume and reducing the aqueous uh, secretion and everything and we try to uh, uh, during the surgery also we will see that actually no much, much not much pressure is uh, exerted onto the globe okay uh, inherent weakness in the anterior hyaloid membrane is and the cause actually for the vitreous disturbances and pseudo exfoliation pseudo capsular exfoliation so this is pseudo exfoliation this is nothing but actually a dendrite a dandruff like material which occurs over the in the pupillary margin and also in the anterior capsule of the lens in these cases normally pseudo exfoliation is associated with the primary open angle glaucoma and uh, these people actually the pupillary dilatation will be very very less when the uh, it will not dilate as in normal people so we'll have actually a problem by doing the surgery uh, so uh, we for uh, pseudo exfoliation what we do is actually uh, suppose if the pupil is not dilated we have pupillary dilators which we use and do the surgery or we do sphincterotomies and do the surgery supracoroidal hemorrhages are this thing So this usually of venous origin, uh, more commonly uh, it occurs with PC rupture and uh, presents as a dark mass posteriorly obscuring the red fundal reflex initially. The expulsive ciliocoroidal hemorrhage was first uh, diagnosed by Wengel in 1786 and short posterior ciliary arteries that are implicated initially. Uh, the expulsive ciliocoroidal hemorrhage usually it occurs during the surgery about one third cases and one third during the three and six hours post operatively and seven hours and nine days later in post operative cases. So uh, the clinical picture is like this as I have told you the incision gets opened just like a frog mouth and all the intraocular structures go slowly they try to come out finally a gush of blood okay. Prophylaxis for uh, expulsive ciliocoroidal hemorrhage, as I already mentioned, hypotensive agents and uh, vasodilators, ascorbic acid with routine, and hyperosmotic agents and digital pressure while after giving the block. And uh, suppose if it is uh, occurring, and you can as well make a tap, supraparoidal tap, on the table by going past that. Early post-operative complications. These are actually hitherto we have discussed about the uh, perioperative complications which come across, we come across during the surgery. So early post-operative complications are hyphema. Hyphema is nothing but blood in the anterior chamber. So hyphema can be a mild hyphema, moderate hyphema, or total hyphema. Okay. So whenever hyphema occurs, if it is a mild, so uh, we give normally. Uh, an antibiotic, steroids, anti-inflammatory drugs, and also cycloplasics. And we give a, a stizolamide also to reduce, because this blood can clog the trabecular meshwork. Uh, it can give rise to a raised intraocular pressure, so we give estrozolamide in the post-operative period. Usually, it comes down. Suppose if it is a total hyphema, and if it doesn't get absorbed near, within, uh, say, five to seven days, so it may cause actually blood staining, the, blood staining of the cornea, which may actually uh, uh, force you to go for actually a keratoplasty. So in such cases, so when it is not absorbing, absorbing, what we do is we do a parasynthesis. We try to aspirate uh, whatever blood is there in the anterior chamber, uh, put in a lot of air, 
and that actually starts there as uh, acts as a styptic and uh, it will not uh, there won't be further bleeding okay and second one is actually the complication is an iris prolapse iris prolapse can occur in the immediate post operative period or even the sometimes or in the middle sometimes sometimes after the uh, post op in the post operative period when the patient will have an inadvertent injury over the eye was which was operated or uh, when he rubs the injury uh, rubs the eye uh, which was operated okay so suppose if the iris prolapse is a recent one and uh, by an examination if, there, if you don't see any slough over the prolapsed iris you can as well repose it back and put a suture and in, suppose if uh, the iris is uh, prolapse is a, a of long duration say some 3 to 4 days and there's already slough formation there are some adhesions in the between the iris and also the uh, uh, surrounding structures in such conditions what we do is actually we do abscission of the iris and deposit back actually the remaining iris and then put a suture there and striate keratopathy so this is a commonly seen complication in the immediate post operative period as i told you the endothelial cell density is most important to have the clarity of the cornea in the post operative period normally at birth the endothelial cell count is around 3000 cells per millimeter square in the adult when we do actually uh, the surgery it can be anywhere between 2000 to 2500 cells per a millimeter square okay so we have to do normally a specular microscopy which most of the centers who don't have it and with specular microscopy you can as well count the number of uh, the uh, endothelial cells you have and the texture of endothelial cells whether they are ligated or all these things actually you can make out and that uh, that helps you in uh, foreseeing uh, the the possibility of uh, grade three or grade four uh, striate keratopathy, which you can inform the patient uh, prior to the surgery, because uh, if the patient goes in for suppose if the endothelial cell count is less than 500 or so, the patient may go in for actually corneal decompensation, and it may necessitate a, a, a keratoplasty in the post-operative period. To, for the patient to have a better vision because the cornea uh, is completely opaque and we will not, you will not be able to uh, see anything unless uh, the cornea is replaced. And anyway, the lens is in place and uh, you will not have any problem then. Okay. And the striate keratopathy, how we treat it is, is uh, in the grade one, the minimal striate keratopathy is common in any case. Okay. So normally, in a, a span of around five to seven days, it gets uh, uh, absorbed and uh, it, it clears off on its own. Now suppose if it is uh, grade three or so, grade two, grade three, uh, so we'll have to give a hypertonic uh, saline, 5% sodium chloride solution, and astrazolamide along with uh, uh, the steroids to reduce striate keratopathy. Suppose if it is grade four and there is already corneal decompensation, a post-operative keratoplasty is a, a only solution to for the patient to have a good vision. Even if you do the most uh, 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 very well than uh, ECI well, if the cornea is not clear, the patient will not be able to see anything. So next complication is a flat anterior chamber. So this flat anterior chamber, Either it can be because of the wound leak. Second one is a celiochoroidal detachment. And the third one is you have a, a pupillary block. Okay. So wound leak, uh, if it occurs, so there can be a, a flat anterior chamber. So what we do is to identify that whenever you see the immediately in the post-operative period, when we open the patch, we see the uh, patient with the slit lamp by microscope. Suppose if uh, the, there is a flat anterior chamber, compare it with the other eye also. And then we do a CDLS test. So we install a drop of uh, freshly prepared uh, fluorescent solution or do you have got a fluorescent strip in the lower phonics and ask the patient to blink so that actually the stain spreads all over the globe. And you try to see the incision with the slit lamp by microscopy using cobalt blue filter. 
suppose if there is dilution of the stain in the that particular area, so that indicates actually the patient is having a leak from that area. So uh, the what we do for wound leak in uh, case in the post-operative period is normally we put the uh, pressure band is and see the patient the next day. Normally it gets uh, uh, closed on its own and we need not do anything. Suppose if the wound leak persists, in such cases actually we take the patient to the dehydra gang and put a suture. Okay. And second one is a ciliochloride attachment. So when you see the fundus, you see actually a red, uh, brownish mass in a one quadrant of uh, the, this thing. Uh, so what we do is, uh, in such cases, we can put the pressure band is and see the patient. Usually it gets resolved on its own. If it doesn't come down, we take the patient to the theater and we make a supraparal tap and also we inject a layer into the anterior chamber and that solves the problem and the ciliopyroid attachment uh, that can uh, get resolved also. Third one is actually a pupillary block due to vitreous bulge. So this was mostly seen uh, whenever we were doing intracapsular cataract extraction or even extracapsular cataract extraction. The vitreous may uh, come into the pupillary region and block and there can be uh, a flat anterior chamber. Iris Bombay can occur. If it actually left like that, there can be peripheral anterior cyanica which will form in about five to seven days and gives rise to actually raise the intraocular pressure. So whenever there is actually pupillary block due to vitreous bulge, uh, what we do is we give uh, estazolamide and also uh, hypertonic uh, uh, solution, mannitol, uh, mannitol 20% solution and uh, we try to dilate the pupil and cycloplegics also they are given. Okay, and uh, uh, suppose still it persists. In such cases, we try to do a peripheral iridotomy with the ag laser. And sometimes, uh, peripheral iridotomy with the ag laser normally it will do. That's how actually we tackle pupillary block. Uh, bacterial end of thalamitis is another uh, dreaded complication in cases of uh, cataract surgery. So what happens is the patient's eye is quiet and white and the patient's vision also was good in the immediate post-operative period. And uh, two days or a, about say 48 to 72 hours after that, suddenly the patient complains actually he has got defective vision. The vision has come down and also the redness, lacrimation, photophobia, pain, all these things they do supervene again. And uh, so the, what, then when you examine the patient, uh, you see a vitreous haze and a yellowish reflex in the pupillary region. And there can be a hypopion that is uh, pus in the anterior chamber or an excrete in the anterior chamber. So the cornea will be hazy and conjunctive congestion, circumcellular congestion can also be there. So in such cases, what we do is actually, this is a direct complication and surgery must, the intervention must be immediate. What we do is actually we take we take an anterior chamber aqueous tap and also the vitreous tap, and we inject uh, a septiadine with uh, vancomycin along with steroid intravitreally, and we this see the case again after 24 hours. Suppose if there is improvement and if uh, the vitreous case is coming down and uh, the AC is uh, clear, we repeat actually the intravitreal injection. Suppose if it doesn't come down, it is going in for worse. In such conditions, we send the case to a vitreal retinal surgeon who will do a pars plana vitrectomy or a core vitrectomy. And uh, that solves mostly the problem. And the prognosis of untreated case of bacterial and ophthalmitis, they are, uh, it's very, very difficult actually. These people, they go in for actual blindness. And finally, we may be forced to do an enucleation in such cases. So again, the incidence of uh, bacterial and ophthalmitis in immediate post-operative period is 0.06% to 0.235%. Source of infection usually is surgeon's respiratory tract or airborne organisms in the operation theater and indigenous flora of the patient's uh, eye itself it can cause. Risk factors for post-operative infections are, again, poor hygiene, a prolonged operating time, unexplained, unplanned ECCE, 
and uh, debilitated immunosuppressed individuals and uh, vitreous uh, disturbance. All these things will occur. Responsible. So the signs and symptoms, they will depend upon actually virulence of the organism and the size of the anaclem, which is actually a, there, and the time of presentation and pre-operative state of the eye. Pre suppose if the patient's, uh, over the patient's eye was uh, in the pre-operative period, uh, the amount of surgical trauma, sometimes actually while doing the surgery, we may cause a lot of trauma to the iris, all these things. Uh, suppose if the patient is a diabetic, local and systemic defense mechanisms, they will be compromised. And uh, so if we, if we, so we advise actually administration of prior uh, antibiotics and also a powder and installation of the drops about uh, say an hour prior to the surgery. So that reduces the bacterial and ophthalmitis. And so the clinical features, they again depend upon actually whether it's bacterial, fungal or sterile. Bacterial is a very severe one. Fungal actually it looks common quiet, but it is also dangerous. And sterile and ophthalmitis can occur. Diagnostic approach, as I have already mentioned, we take actually aqueous step, we trace step, and we give the treatment. Late post-operative complications. So I think late post-operative complications we take up in the next class. Now I'm going to show you Grish. Now I am going to show you actually femtosecond assisted laser. Okay. Femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> 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 Like <laughs> 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 During laser-assisted cataract surgery, During laser cataract surgery, your ophthalmologist will use a laser instrument guided by a computer. The la During Laser assisted cataract surgery, your ophthalmologist will use a laser instrument guided by a computer. The laser is used to make small openings in the side of your cornea. 
It is also used to soften the cloudy lens's hard cataract tissue. Then your eye surgeon will insert a pen-shaped instrument through the opening to reach the lens. This instrument uses a special type of energy to break up the center of the cloudy lens. Then it will carefully suction out the lens pieces. Your surgeon will then insert an artificial lens called an intraocular lens or IOL. This IOL will stay in your eye permanently. The new lens lets light pass through and focus properly on the retina, bringing back clear vision. So, so that's the surgery. And uh, next class, next class we are going to take up actually late post-operative complications, a congenital cataract, and also various types of IOLs and uh, displacement of the lens. I think uh, Monday I'm going to complete it. Okay, last time the last time we got it.